I'm here with Ken Graham, and you are the director of the National Hurricane Center. And so, what do you have any suggestions of before a hurricane? There's a lot of people who don't want to leave, so they definitely need to prepare for um, staying there and for the aftermath. What do you think is the most important thing to consider when preparing for a hurricane to stay? I think one of the biggest things is knowing your risk. I think if you know your risk, then you can prepare and mitigate that risk. And one of the things is, are you on the coast? Are you in an evacuation zone? Because even if you want to stay, if you're in one of those evacuation zones, and, and we have a storm surge forecast that's dangerous or unsurvivable in a dangerous situation, and the local officials say to leave, you have to leave. Now, now remember, you may not have to go all the way 100 miles or 400 miles. You may only have to go 10, 20 miles to get away from the coast. But knowing your risk, are you by the water? The storm surge is one of the biggest things. 80% of fatalities in tropical systems is the water. So that's what we have to prepare for. And if you're told to leave, you, get, you have to go. Yeah. So then um, gasoline and getting out, is that something power, is that something that people need to maybe stock up on before the hurricanes come? Even, not even a week, because sometimes in our experience, Gas can be out a week or two before the hurricane actually comes inland. Yeah, not just gasoline, but water and food. Every, the lines are just incredibly long. So the biggest thing is preparing early. Have a, have a kit. Have some of those supplies early, you know, months ahead of time before the first, first hurricane. And if you have that kit, you know, you go to the grocery store. Instead of buying, I'm making this up, a, a couple cans of green beans, buy an extra one and put it in your kit. But remember, you got to have a manual can opener, not electric can opener, in case there's no power. But have just that supplies early. Get that stuff early. And it's not just before. It's after. You, you might get through the hurricane, but afterwards, it's the power may be out. You, you, you have to have food. You have to have water. And you need about a gallon of water, several gallons of water a day per person. So yeah, especially being out, cleaning hot. up the yards. It's hot. Um, yeah. yeah, exactly. You're going to need more water than usual. Yeah. So, so you've got to have the supplies. Too. You're right. It's just got to have it all ready to go. Mm -hmm. So water purification systems, is that something that, in your experience, a lot of people don't actually have. They think, oh, the water will still be working. It's pressurized, but it might be contaminated. It might be contaminated, yeah. So you have to have a way to boil the water if you have to to, to decontaminate it or, you know, have the, the camping tablets that you could add to, to purify the water. But the biggest thing is you have the containers. Have lots of water. Don't, be, don't, don't try to cut it too close. Have lots and lots of water. Prepare for weeks. You know, I have 27 years of doing this, I've seen, you know, you, it could last months in the biggest of hurricanes. After Hurricane Katrina here, yeah. uh, it could be months that you have to take care of yourself with water, with food. So just bathtub. You can fill your bathtub full of water. Because, I mean, you're not really going to be taking a bath in it after the hurricane. The biggest thing is probably going to make sure you have some water. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing you could do. Have plenty of food and plenty of water. Um, another way to boil it, if you... If you run out of your sterno cans and all that kind of stuff, it would be a good skill to know how to... We have stuff like a Kelly kettle where you just use a few twigs. That's something... Um, stuff that you need to have beforehand, but it will really help you if you're staying afterwards, really. Yeah, it, it really will. And then some of the other stuff that we don't always talk about, it's, it's your medicines. A lot of the, oh, yeah. a lot of the people that, that, that get hurt and some of the, even the fatalities after the hurricane, it's mostly health-related. So it, it's, it's cardiac arrest where you may not be able to get help. It's not having your medicine. So you've got to make sure you have plenty of supply of your medicines, plenty of anything that you need that you normally have. And if it's too sensitive where you can't get that, that stuff that you need, that, that critical stuff to keep you healthy, you may have to go somewhere else to make sure that you can get it. So that's just, everyone's risk is a little different. So you have to understand the risk where you live. You have to understand your personal risk and your health and understand, well, how sensitive is it that I get my medicine, and that's something else you have to consider. So it's all about yourself, but the key here is what you're doing on, on this video. It's having that information early. Mm -hmm. It's getting the information early, preparing super early, because think about the stress in a hurricane. Yeah. It's not the time to be figuring this stuff out. You gotta do it now. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about how a lot of people who stay for the hurricane, their issues later, if you have food, if you have water, that leaves medical. You're a ham. Have, it, have you ever been in a situation where people need to be evacuated after the fact so that they can get the medical attention they need? Um, have you ever had to relay that information over ham radio? Yeah, we did. And Hurricane Katrina, even working for the National Weather Service here in New Orleans, where we are today, 
Um, after Katrina, there, there's no phones, there's yeah. no cell phones. None of the, everybody has these fancy cell phones, mm -hmm. but after the big hurricane, they're not working. The cell towers could be they're down because yeah. of electricity or because they were actually blown over. Exactly. Yeah. So what's left? Ham radio. So after Katrina, I had my portable ham radio, and, and I used it to be able to relay information, but there were people mm -hmm. being evacuated. And at the office, at the National Weather Service in New Orleans, it was the only way that the office could communicate mm -hmm. was through that ham radio. And the first message was, we're okay. Think about that, even from a standpoint of a meteorologist and the weather service, we're okay. We got through it, and, mm -hmm. and, and it's how to take care of employees and how to take care of the community. After that. Well, because if they weren't okay, if they couldn't get information out, or even if they were completely blown out and nobody's there, if you try and get in and you spend all those weeks trying to get in as fast as you can to find no one there, then all your supplies are going to go to waste when they could have gone to another town. So even... If there is one person left and you know they're going to get in contact with you, if they're still even alive, you can understand, we need to help these people. Exactly and that, right. that could save the lives that are left. Again, see how it helps? It's, just, it's all communication. That's what you're talking about. It's the importance of communication. And mm -hmm. when it all starts to fail, what's going to be left? And, and a lot of times it is a ham radio. So I, it's just encouraging everybody that, that's watching, mm -hmm. have multiple ways to receive information, have multiple ways to send information. And, and now, you, you all know, you, you can send you know, information over the ham radio like never yeah. before. Emails, information, graphics, all that mm -hmm. can be sent out. And, and that's huge. So that's called preparedness. And having the, your ham license and being able to mm -hmm. do that, it's just a, a big part of being prepared. And also getting out into the field and actually learning how to <laughs> deploy in those situations where you're not sitting in your ham shack with the air conditioning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, getting out there, get to, talking to people, seeing who needs help, and be able to use a ham radio to radio that back into to home base and say that, that we need some things here. That's, yeah. that's a huge part of the community, and that's part of taking care of your neighbor and the vulnerable mm -hmm. population, because the, the data shows that people losing their lives most in a hurricane mm -hmm. are those, those most vulnerable. Yeah. And, and so it's about helping those most vulnerable ahead of time, helping them with the supplies, mm -hmm. and you know, a big part of that, getting that information out there after the fact. Because remember, you said it, and it was such important words that you said. It's not just before the hurricane and during. Afterwards, it's, it's a long road after a hurricane. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when a hurricane goes through, it's only there for a day. But afterwards, we had one hurricane, Hurricane Irma, a few years back that we were out of power for like three weeks. Um, but there are some times when, it, like you said, it can last months. And... Say you prepared, but your neighbor didn't prepare. You need to also have those extra stuff and the willingness to help other people around you. So, no, yeah. it is. And, and you look at the data. You look at the stats. You look, Hurricane Laura hit Louisiana in 2020. It was a horrible storm, just a, mm -hmm. a very powerful storm. We forecast 15 to 20 feet of storm surge. Mm -hmm. Think about that. I know, I know. <clears throat> Start looking up. It's, it's a significant storm Two surge. Floors up. And we measured it was over 17 feet, up to 18 feet of storm mm -hmm. surge. And we called it unsurvivable. Here's what's interesting about that. So we were able to get everyone out. Yeah. The local officials were getting people out of harm's way. We didn't lose a single person to storm surge in Hurricane Laura. Historically, it's a leading cause of fatalities. The number one cause of fatalities was after the fact, carbon monoxide poisoning, yeah. improper use of generators and, and equipment. And you think about power lines down. A power line on a fence electrifies the fence mm -hmm. if the power line's still alive. You know, people using chainsaws for the first time. There's all sorts of things that take place afterwards. That's where we got it. Everyone has to realize you may make it through, but afterwards is, is a rough road. So you have to be ready for weeks, if not a month, in, in the yeah. biggest of hurricanes. So you said generators, and people were getting hurt because they didn't realize they needed to exhaust their, yeah. their generators. In your experience, what do you think is the most reliable and safe, even, way of creating energy? So that you, you can talk to people, let them know you're okay. You can. You can do your laptops and your phones to call people if cell towers are still around to call your families. What do you, what do you think is the most reliable? I'll tell you, generators are a great thing to have. I mean, I, I've mm -hmm. used generators for many, many years, but it's well away from the house. It's never indoors. It's yes. never near a window. We ventilate it well. It's way over there. And a great story in Hurricane Isaac, we had a, had a generator. Mm -hmm. It's a 15-year-old generator, and it still worked fine. And, and I had it started, had the family going, mm -hmm. but I had to work. Because any hurricane, I'm at, I'm at the office. Mm -hmm. The phones were up still, and my wife would call and say, the generator's still running fine, day one. Day mm -hmm. two, generator's still fine. I said, what about the fuel? She was barely using any fuel. Day three, mm -hmm. hardly any fuel. Day four, hardly any fuel, and it was still running. Mm -hmm. So come to find out, 
I thought it was the greatest generator on earth. It's it, it the most efficient generator ever made in, in, in the world. Come mm -hmm. to find out the neighbors were sneaking over in the middle of the night and filling it up with fuel to make sure the family was taken care of. So those are the stories about mm -hmm. taking care of neighbors. But there's new technology too. And I think you probably, I think you two are, I think you all are very into the technology part of all this, yeah. I would imagine. But there's some new technology about using, using batteries. Mm -hmm. So, you know, using a battery on solar panels. So, you know, can get information mm -hmm. about generators. You can look at solar powered batteries to, to power, you know, your mm -hmm. cell phones, to, you know, a fan or maybe being able to, to cook something. So there's all sorts mm -hmm. of technology out there to have power afterwards. But the biggest thing, no matter you use, just, it's got to be safe. Yeah. So, I don't know if you know this, but we actually build solar stuff. Um, so in our experience, solar is the most stealthy in a way, which is big because if your neighbors didn't prepare, you, you want to try and help your neighbors. You want to make sure you have enough for you, but you want to make sure you have enough for those around you, those who, if they're the old lady next to you, go and help her have, make a meal or whatever because maybe she couldn't get to, you know, those vulnerable people who need help. Um, but there have been experiences where there were people who did not want to go prepare themselves. Not that they couldn't, but when after several days afterwards, they didn't have anything. They thought it was going to be like three days maybe at most. But then the generators um, that our neighbor had, they got stolen or people were getting violent because they knew that you had it because um, they could hear it. So you want to make sure that you're going to keep yourself safe, your family safe and all. Because if people are getting all upset that they don't have anything anymore, right. um, yeah, you want to make sure that you can still provide for yourself that energy that you need for whatever it is. So that, that's um, something that we found is a great use for solar. Generators, um, like you're saying, in my experience, they have been great, as long as your neighbors are nice. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but you need to make sure you have fuel. That's another thing. Um, in your experience, what do, you, what do you think people should be doing about fuel for their generators? Uh, it's starting early, right? I mean, we've all seen the gas lines. And it's, just, yeah. it's all backed up. And that's not the time to, to go. I mean, you're going to be sitting in those lines. You're burning fuel mm -hmm. as you're waiting to get fuel. Yeah. Um, so you go early. Fill up those gas cans. Have a same, safe place to store those gas cans. Have it early. And prepare to make sure you can run that generator. We already talked about it. Not just a few days, but for, for weeks just in case. Yeah. So with that, I think we've covered before. We've covered after. So preparedness is really the biggest thing whether it's for food, water purification, whether it's for power, or even if it's getting out there, uh, out of the storm surge area. So if, if you don't have anything else to add, uh, I think we've covered everything. No, just a big thank you to you for getting the word out. I mean, this is just a great way to get the word out. Thank you for having your, your YouTube channel and talking about safety because it's not just prepared us before. It's getting through the storm. And as we covered really well here, and you're so great at this, it's all that time afterwards and keeping safe. So thanks for what you do. Well, thank you for sharing with us. And thank you for teaching the viewers um, a little bit about what they need to do this hurricane season because it's going to be a big one, I think. Going to be busy. Yeah. <laughs>